Hello and welcome to the Rock on Tours podcast. I am Gary Kemp. And I am Guy Pratt. This week on the show, we are talking bass with, oh, another of the country's finest bass players. Singer, songwriter, producer, and actor, and founding member of Duran Duran. Please welcome Mr. John Taylor. Where did you spend your lockdown, John? Here yeah, in Los Angeles. How was it for you? It was good, actually. I got the virus like right at the beginning. Oh. So I got it out of the way and I kind of, I mean, I had to really work on not being smug about it, you know, because obviously a lot of people were hurting, but I was like, you know, it was a couple of really rough days. Right. But, um, but then I kind of enjoyed not having to travel because I'm always back and forth a lot. I feel like I'm either packing or unpacking. You know, the first few months I really, I really enjoyed it. And uh, we got over to England about, I got back about a month ago. We were there for three weeks and right. um, that was nice. I mean, I'm getting a little restless. Yeah, you know, you got to find things like you guys well, doing this. Isn't you it? Would, just got to find things to do. Yeah, well, you were doing the same thing as me, John. Right? Where you are uh, doing videos showing breaking down your bass lines. Oh, did you do that? I did. Do <laughs> yeah. That. yeah, he pretends he doesn't know. Look, I, <laughs> no, I, I mean, I never thought that was the last thing I thought I'd ever do. But actually, it was it was terrific, and it, it forced me to show up at the bloody instrument. You know, it's not like the edge, is it? When it's like you know, the edge teaching people how to play. You know, and he turns off all the effects, and he's just going ding. <laughs> you know, you were actually doing a great job there on the bass there, John. Oh, thanks. I have to say this because surra- I've got a pincer movement of bass guitarists. <laughs> but you come from a time when the bass played the lead, which is the sort of, you know, when we both started out in music and, the se- and for Guy as well. Suddenly the bass guitar, which was normally just in the background, supportive, was now up front. In punk rock, it wasn't really a thing, was it? I mean, there were some really good looking you know, Sid and Paul Simon, and there were some bass sort of stylists. But the kind of the new wave dance music that started to appear at the end of the 70s, bass became super important. I think it was like the disco influence. I mean, certainly for me, totally, I felt the totally. like cheek. That was the first time I really listened to bass. And yes, in a way, it felt like it was leading, it was leading the track, but it didn't sound terribly difficult to me. It felt like something I could do a reasonably good imitation of, and I think that's why I turned to that. Because I had been playing guitar kind of so-so, and I thought, I think I could do a better job as a bassist. Because, I mean, I didn't know any guys that were thinking seriously about playing bass, but everybody wanted to be a guitarist. Your yeah, well, bass players always say that, but really, is it the truth, isn't it? Always like, we've already got a guitarist, do you play bass? Oh, well, I can get one of those. Because that was your story, wasn't it? Well, my, yeah, that was my thing, because I wanted a guitar against my wishes. I got given a bass, but and which I hated. But when I got back to school, about three or four other people have been given guitars. And you suddenly realize, but if any of them wants to be a band... Yeah. They need me. So suddenly, actually, you're in charge. Right. <laughs> so my, my, brother was a, my, <laughs> well, my brother was a guitar player in a punk band called The Defects. Their best song was We Are The Defects, So People Say. To which I would say, what <laughs> people are even saying it? <laughs> like, like, like who? Name yeah, them. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, people are saying. And then, and then <laughs> we, 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 you know, we already had me and Steve Norman playing guitar. So uh, it was like, well, Martin, I'm going to have to teach you the bass, of course. You two then end up as the best looking bass players in the world. Before that, it was Bill Wyman. My God, what happened to bass players? You know, suddenly you were pop stars. I don't know. I mean, I mean, you know, we're going back now. And I I always think it's interesting to think back to the 70s. And I know where you guys were coming from when when we would get the the music media, you know, whether it was the NME or the Melody Maker or whatever. And they had the end of the year poll, you know, and there would be the best bass player of the year, best people player of the year, best drummer of the year, you know, which is insane to think of today, you know, because it's just not even a thing anymore. But I'm forgetting Um, Paul McCartney, of course. Let's not forget Paul McCartney, of course. Yeah, but, you know, even even something like Chris Squire, you know, who really had a unique voice, Mm -hmm. you know, and I think that um, we knew about musical personalities and the dynamics of bands and the chemistry of bands, you know. I was never terribly interested in artists that just kind of sang their songs with a backup band. I loved the idea that every every instrument was kind of maxed out, that the drummer was a full-on personality, yeah. like Roger Taylor, or to name one off the top of my head, you know, and as was the guitar player, as was the bassist. And, and it all came together to make this sort of interesting... You know, yeah, with, with Led Zeppelin, this or, interesting hole. <clears throat> well, with you guys, because it seemed it was because it was you and Nick, wasn't it? Really, right? Who, but you were looking at the concept of a band almost more than a band, weren't you? I mean, 
it seems like when you started well we we'd had um like the very first duran duran we started at my art college and i'd met this guy Stephen duffy who i worked with for years and yes. uh, <laughs> Yeah, and, 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 and Stephen was a songwriter, and so we were looking to find a way to put his songs to music. And, um, and Nick bought a wasp, which was this really radical piece of kit that came on the market. That must have been like 77, end of 77, this plastic synthesizer that, that kind of like, had like sequency sounds in it. So you could make those kinds of ultravox sounds, but very, very easily. It was like the next step up from the stylophone. And we bought a K rhythm box that you get in like a Hammond organ with presets like Foxtrot and Mambo. <laughs> and, and, and so that was the first sort of wave of the band. But then Stephen left us to form another band, more of a, and it was more of a rock, Bob Dylan kind of influence thing. So Nick and I, it kind of put us against the wall a little bit, right? We've got to prove something here. And so we really went full on electronica at that point. And then... Roger was the next guy that, that we met. I mean, then we started thinking about these, the rhythm section and the rhythm section should be a thing, which nobody had really thought about. 76, 77, you know, nobody was thinking, we've got to make a rhythm section that's interesting. And, uh, you know, I was really into George Murray and Dennis Davis, you know, the Bowie mm-hmm. rhythm section and those Roxy music rhythm sections. Yeah. So Roger and I, we would spend all afternoon like practicing a fill. You know, where we both go, boom, 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 dun, 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 dun. You know, and we just go over it and over it and over it and then put it into the track. You know, we learned to play. That's how I learned to play. Who first turned you on as a, as a kid? Did you go through the same sort of stuff that, that we all went through, glam rock and then into punk and soul? Yeah, well, the Beatles were massive, obviously, and they were particularly big in my house because my mother was a scouser and she was like, she was housebound, and they came into our house like angels. They were big. I also got from them. I was an only child, and I got from them that they were like these four brothers, you know, and they all dressed the same, yeah. you know. They were like Can the you imagine if one had you ginger know, hair, went, uh, curly? <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't have worked, would it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you're right. But, you know, they, and, they kind of, and they went around the world, and they just, they just did everything that I wanted to do as a kid. And then Bowie was the, you know, as I was coming of age, like 72, 11, 12, Boland, then Bowie, mm. Rod I was into as well. Yeah, me too. Queen, yeah, yeah. And all these bands that I'm going to see on big stages, you know, and you've got a queue overnight for a ticket, you know, and all of that. And thinking, wow, this is, this is so amazing. And really sort of being enthralled to that world, but not thinking that it was a world that I could participate in. And then the Pistols come along. And I'm probably 15 when I first heard about them. And, you know, that changed everything because, you know, I like to say that, you know, you didn't really have to know all that much. In fact, the less you knew technically about making music, the better you were equipped to join the punk yeah. rock revolution. What, what, you know, who, and was it, was it, it, who was in Birmingham? Who was in Birmingham? Well, everybody was in Birmingham because, well, everybody was in Birmingham. I mean, I, I mean, I went to see The Clash were my band. I used to yeah. go and see The Clash yeah. all over. I probably saw them about seven or eight times in. 77, 78, Susie and the Banshees, who were like the first of the second wave of punk bands. I mean, I went to see them also. I traveled yeah, that, around. That was the when the fan, they, she was a fan forming a band, really. Because yeah. when I forced Yeah, just... I never saw the Pistols. I, I never saw the Pistols. No one, no one. I Rhodes. saw the Pistols. I saw them no, with No, no, but Nick Rhodes did. Uh, Nick, Nick, Nick did. And, and Nick will say to me, like, every six months, you'll find an opportunity to say, you never, you didn't <laughs> see the pistols, did you, Johnny? You both say. I was like, I once asked Chris Spedding because Chris Spedding played at that uh, the punk rock festival at, at the Hundred Club, which yeah. at least thirty thousand people were at. I've met thirty thousand people who were there, right? And uh, <laughs> and and I said, so Chris, how many people were actually there? And he said, well, when the pistols went on, it was about fifteen. When they went off, a lot yeah. less. Yeah. <laughs> but it's amazing the impact that they did that they did have. You know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I remember the same thing. And for me, the band that I actually ended up following was Generation X and, and Billy Idol. I love Generation X. Love them. Because what we ended up going on to do was was to take a lot of that punk ethos and that energy and that do it yourself feel, you know, mixing it with 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 disco and electronica, obviously, but not being ashamed of being pop stars. And Billy was probably the only one in punk that wanted to be a pop star. And he, of course, he ended up becoming one. In his own yeah. way, the punk ethos was undoubtedly alive in what in what we were doing. I mean, you had to own your own 
your your own ground, didn't you? You know, there was just nothing worse at that time than copying somebody else because it just felt like, I mean, that everybody had their thing, you know, anybody that was interesting. And there was enough fertility, you know, there was enough interesting stuff happening that you could claim your own your own so, ground. So how did I you thought that was all, the most how, important how thing. Did, how did you end up meeting Simon then? And, and, and what were your first early gigs? And, and how much did the Rum Runner have to do with it all? This is the, the club in Birmingham. Well, the Rum Runner was important. I mean, you know, that was Nick and I looking around the city, looking for alternative venues. And I remember we'd gone, it was a Friday afternoon, and we'd gone to this place called the Icon Gallery, which was this sort of alternative art space. And we talked to them about if they were interested in putting like, on a performance. Like the Indica and, of Burma. And they were, <laughs> yeah, and they, exactly. And they, and they weren't particularly interested. We were just, I mean, we, literally, we were walking up the street by the town hall, and there was a poster, and it was the Bowie Golden Years, the shot where he's got the blonde hair and the mm. cigarette. And it had Rum Runner, Bowie Nights, Tuesday. Right. And we were like, oh, Rum Runner. The Rum Runner was like this old school place. It was like, who goes to the Rum Runner? And we were like, well, that kind of looks interesting. We literally walked there. Up the steps, we saw this like office up above the club. And we walked in and met Paul Barrow. And, uh, and we got the tape on us. And he said, well, let's go and have a listen to it. And we went downstairs. And, and, and you know, I didn't know this at the time, but him and his brother had just been to New York for like six months earlier. They'd been to Studio 54. And they'd come back with dreams of having their own Studio 54 in Birmingham. So, you know, it was all about, like, get as much mirror flex up as possible and palm trees, but also a stomping sound system. Yeah. And he turned on this sound system and put on our demo tape that we'd done with Bob Lamb, who'd been working ah, with UB40. Yeah. And Bob was, Bob was really important in the Birmingham scene as well. And so he put this tape on it. I mean, it sounded fucking great. And so he's like, hmm, you know, my brother and I have been looking to get involved in, in music. You know, you should get the rest of the boys together and come down to the club tonight. And um, that was like the start of it. And, um, you know, at that point, we didn't have Simon and we didn't have Andy. We had another singer and another guitar player. Oh. But they kind of got lost in the next, the next couple of months. But these, these managers were keepers. And they started seeding us a little bit. They brought me an amp and they brought a drum kit and gave us somewhere to rehearse and, how did and you gave us jobs. Well, Simon, Simon was at the university studying drama and his lap mate had a job at the Rum Runner. It was a fun time, actually. Well, actually, no, it wasn't fun. But we were auditioning <laughs> guitar players and singers and they were coming from all over the place. I even remember John Densmore came. I mean, I don't know how the hell that happened. <laughs> the guitar player from The Doors showed up in Birmingham and we were like, well, he's not right. Uh, he was lost, but, obviously. Uh, it was so bizarre. Yeah, he, met, he was on his way to see Judas Priest. Um, but, um, but like we'd say to the guitar players, no, the singer's off today, you know, he's sick. And we'd say to the singers, yeah, the guitar player, he's got to go and see his mother or whatever, you know. Right. But at the same time, we're kind of building this core, which was Roger... Nick and myself, but we're, we're sort of developing a sound that works with drum machine patterns and sequences. So Simon is living with this girl who's working at the Rum Run, and she's seeing that we're going through this procession of, of singers. And she says, you know, you should meet my boyfriend, you know, my flat, I, I forget if they were flatmates or, or boyfriend, you should meet him. So she goes home and she says, you should go and meet these guys that are working at the club. So he comes down and, um, I mean, to be honest with you, it was like even before he sang a note, I knew he had it. I mean, we were pretty desperate at this point, but like I just looked at him. We talked about music for like 15 minutes. I remember he didn't sing the first day. He just came and we just met. And I, I'm not sure whether it's because I was late or he was late, but we just chatted. And I thought, this guy's got it. And uh, wow. he came back the next day and he brought his lyrics. I mean, that was like gold, Gary. Gold lyrics, you know, <laughs> lyrical ideas. Because we got but tracks. Not gold. At this point. We he got never tracks. had. We... He never wrote gold. <laughs> not no, actually that... gold. I just want to make that. I just want to put that out there and make it clear. Sing blue. Before there's another court case. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because uh, if I can just jump back, John. This first tape of yours that you took into the run, is there anything on that that would be recognisably Duran Duran? Were you kind of already there, or was it even, oh. or a song that went on to? become one of well those. there was you know one of the back and forths from our, our early career was girls on film because we you know and, and we like you Gary you know we've been back and forth with one of the earlier singers so there was a there was a version of girls on film girls on oh. film went through a number of iterations we held on to that hook 
um, and and kept changing with different the, lyrics. Um, or did, did Simon write those? Yeah, lyrics? yeah, yeah. All right. No, no, no. I see. No, he didn't write those lyrics. It's interesting talking to you because it is unbelievably like listening to myself giving an interview because <laughs> the parallels between what you were into growing up, what turned you on growing up. You know, you saw that Bowie night on a Tuesday night at the Rum Runner. I had seen a flyer that Steve Dagger had saying Bowie night at the Blitz Club. Actually, it wasn't the Blitz Club then. It was a, it was called Billy's, and then we eventually moved to Blitz. The whole sort of yeah. thing that was seen that was happening in Birmingham was completely parallel to what was happening. Well, in for a London. second there, I thought it was going to be that Rusty was going up to Birmingham and doing yeah. a Bowie night as well as yeah, doing yeah. the one in London. <clears throat> but I remember when we our first single came out just before yours in in in, in forty years ago, in the end of uh, at the yeah. end of nineteen eighty. And we had a gig the next day. We did Top of the Pops. We had a gig up in um, yeah. the Botanical Gardens. Yeah. And then we all went to the Rum Runner afterwards. And then we went back yeah. to Paul Barrow's, I think it was Paul's place, or one of the twins. And uh, I ended up sleeping on the floor in his, in his house. But I remember meeting Nick and Nick saying, I've got a band. But I don't know if you were there, John. Were you? Were you... Yeah, I, I was there. Absolutely. I mean, I mean the day before... We'd gotten the record. We got to cut a long story short. We took it back, played it on the sound <laughs> system, listened to it, made notes, Poo -pooed compared it. it to where we were at. And then we went to see you guys. And, um, you know, and you'd done Top of the Pops. You looked amazing. You know, I, and the thing is, of course, you think, oh, well, we're so different. But, you know, from the outside looking in, there, you know, there were a lot of similarities. And I scene. think for us, yeah, well, well, it became a scene the moment we saw you. You know, because it was like, oh, right. You know, there's there's something going on here. And I think you guys, I think Betty Page called you New Romantics. I'm, yeah, Betty I, Page. I'm, yeah. I'm not exactly sure how that New Romantic term, well, there's, but it was like New Romantic. I mean, Dylan yeah. Jones has probably got the I'm authority not, on this now, but it was uh, there was a center page spread with us interview just before we released our first single, and it was called New Romantics. That was Betty. But a guy called Perry Haynes, who you... Oh, as well, uh, I yeah. think. I think he says that he invented it and wrote it in the standard. Or I, I don't know what the truth is, but yeah, there was a scene. I remember we came up to do that gig. We brought about twenty people on a coach, and I think yeah. by the time they got off the coach, they didn't look their best anyway. But they would. It was, <laughs> but it was a bit like that sort of face-off in the Wild Ones, you know, <laughs> the Birmingham crew and the. The the yeah. Because also, surely the first sign of a scene, if you have a scene, is that the the thing that actually makes us is that the bands in it hate each other. Isn't <laughs> yeah. <that>? yeah. <laughs> but I remember going back and sleeping on the floor at, at Barrow's house and flat. That's, am that's amazing. We were all we were all crashed amazing. out there. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's a little nugget right there. I didn't know that. He nicked an ashtray. Uh, <laughs> oh, <I nicked> <laughs> yeah. Great, you can have it. But uh, you know, then your time came as well, didn't it? You know, I mean that that first album. Was it all the stuff you'd been working on and building over how long? Yeah, I mean, Simon joined the band, I think it was June. And uh, I said, OK, we've got a gig in a month. So we need a gig's worth of material, you know. And, and, and to me, I've always been driven to, I love stages, guys. I see a stage in a church hall. I'm like, I want to be on there. And I was, <laughs> that, that to me was the magic, was, was getting to do that, where you stood up on the stage above everybody else, the lights went down. And you know, and on whatever level, whether you're, whether you're in a little club or church hall or a stadium, that you get to generate this this event, if you like. And it's not even about everybody like worshiping me. It's really just about being able to create this this musical experience that we all partake in. I think, to some degree, it's about turning off the bullshit for 19 minutes. It's like turning off real life. And I always loved that. You know, that to me was the appeal when I used to go to see artists like Roxy Music or Queen. You know, so all the clash was that just like all the, the BS of the day just got turned off because the yeah. experience of live music was so powerful. So for me, it's always been about we need material so we can create the show. That's the drive for me. And um, so, it wasn't, so it wasn't you know, about that, making that, the records so much. It wasn't about well, making no, the less so. Like Nick's the opposite. He's the other side. Nick would live in the studio. He would happily never go out on stage. I mean, or maybe once. In a blue moon, you know, I, I love cue lights, cut the light. It's like my, my blood pressure comes down. My heart rate goes back to normal. Because yeah. from the very beginning, your records were always very sophisticated. And was there a, a worry about kind of recreating that live? Well, not really. I mean, yeah. I mean, actually, the first couple of albums, what you hear is what you get. You know, it's like there's not that many layers of 
But they sounded oh, like uh, it. I mean, that's yeah. obviously good production. They sounded like the future, you know, that was, which is what the time Well, was, we were so. lucky to be connected. Colin Thurston was like, we had Colin for the first couple of records. And, you know, Colin had worked on the Berlin Bowie Iggy Sessions. Mm -hmm. He'd become a go-to guy for new music. He was producing Bow Wow Wow magazine. He did the first Human League album. He just raised our game. I can honestly say, yeah. you know, we all came out of the studio sounding a lot better than we thought we were. I mean, Andy had a pretty sort of oh, heavy, yeah. unique sound. I mean, he, he wasn't trying to play Noel Rogers at all. He was more playing sort of, you know, a, a heavier rock sound, wasn't he? The day I met Andy, he came down from Newcastle and he, he had a Marshall 50 watt combo and he, he brought that with him and a guitar. And uh, I'd, I'd watched the old Ray Whistle Test the night before and Gary Moore had been on it. I was really knocked out because the thing that nobody was, to me, to my limited knowledge, was doing was getting that sort of Nile Rodgers, tickety, tickety, tickety kind of clean funk sound, but also knew how to really play the power and really, really crank up the volume. And I heard that in Gary Moore. I mean, I wouldn't have said jazzy back then, but he could do both. And he was, and in his solo, and in the spot he did on the whistle test. And Andy walks in and says, oh, yeah, Gary Moore, he's my favorite. He's my favorite guitar player. So that was like, okay, because what we're trying to do here, we want the groove, but we also want, we also want the beef. Honestly, Andy was the first guy that really, that really got that. And he wasn't a punk rock guitar player. I mean, he wanted to be Angus Young. You know, I mean, he, he probably knew more about, you know, about dominance and, 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 and major sevenths. And, well, he was the only one that really knew about any of that stuff. He'd, he'd, he'd had a lot of experience running his own bands through U.S. Air Force bases in Germany. And, you know, and, I mean, we couldn't have done it. We just couldn't have done it without now, in your, in, It would have been a very different proposition. In our scene, you know, in this club, you know, we, we sort of had this ready-made creatives around us. So we had, you know, kids who would, who would design clothes for us, people who would write words and design the lights and... And that, and take pictures, yeah. whatever. Did was that the same with you guys up at the Rum Runner? Did you have a scene up in Birmingham? A little bit, not so much. So we were talking earlier about the DIY aspect, you know, and you would design your own flyers. I've got pages of early logos that I was designing, and you know, and early posters. But I mean, really, when we signed to EMI, and I mean, like you guys, I mean, we got a record deal really fast. You know, I mean, literally, we had like seven songs. And we got a record deal because it was a band moment, wasn't it? It was. And, and, and it's been a band moment since, since the pistol. I know. And I think, you know, I mean, we've been signed, you know, and, and they were looking for another one of those. And there you were. And the EMI wanted it. And uh, and and suddenly there was there was a scene growing within within a while. There was, you yeah. know, there, there would have been Culture Club come along. There were lots of bands at the time. But it did come down to, especially in the UK and Europe, it came down to sort of a bit of a face off between Duran and Spandau. There was that. Well, that was built. good for everyone, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, it was good for everyone because it gave it, it was like a spirit of, uh, uh, of competition and it was great for the kids. But of course, like I love to say, but we got on famously. Talking as a bystander here, I'm sitting here with one of Spandau, one of Duran, and I'm, and you know, my natural impulse is fight, 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 fight. <laughs> not the face, not the face. <laughs> but obviously you guys ended up well, I mean, we all ended up doing well. There was one thing that really broke, I think, both of us in a big way, and that was MTV coming along in the in the eighties. Because, you know, it was all very well hearing our tunes on American radio, but it, it didn't make quite as much sense unless you saw the video. Was that? The, it was certainly well, was true for us. Was that true for you guys? Well, the videos. I mean, I don't know about you, Gary, but I mean, I mean, videos were not on my radar. I mean, when I was thinking about what our album covers are going to look like and what our Press photos are going to look like, and what the what the lights and the clothes are going to look like. I wasn't thinking, and now videos are going to be like that. Yeah, this exactly. I had no, I never even gave that a thought. I never even put together the like the Bohemian Rhapsody thing that we saw when you know week after week after week on top of the pops. And then I remember the Vienna. There was this film for Ultravox's Vienna, which was like a take on the Third Man, which was Russell Mulcahy, yes. who ended well, up yes. directing our videos. Exactly. And videos. You fought exactly. over him, didn't you? Fought, and tussled think, for Russell. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I feel we were very, you know, that was something. I mean, listen, everybody that rises up, you know, that to some kind of, I mean, I don't want to say phenomenal, but to a really big level, there's some technological element that plays a part, you know, whether it's multi-track recording, TV, you know, radio, whatever it is. We had the music video 
And I remember, you know, for us, we, you know, planet Earth had got us onto the top of the top, it had gone top 10 in the UK. And the next territory it started breaking out of was Australia. And so, you know, EMI were talking to our management about, well, you know, maybe the boys need to go down there and promote it. And everybody was like, well, it's a long way to go <laughs> to promote a single. And I remember like one of the ladies at EMI said, well, you could make a video. And it was like a video. What's a video? <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, leave it to us. It, it's not going to cost long. Just show up at, at St. John's Wood at nine o'clock on Thursday morning. And that's where we met Russell. You know, and Russell loved us. And when I say us, I mean Spandau and Duran. I mean, we were just like, I mean, he loved it. And little did we know, we walk into this scene, the music video scene, which was this industry in London. Talk about competition between Scott Mullaney, Grant, Russell. I mean, yeah. these guys are writing all the rules in London. Grant did our first You know, video. 79, 80, 81. I felt very fortunate to be the benefit of, of Russell's genius at that, but, at, at but, that moment. But I think we with Russell... Spandau may have started the video wars by chance, but actually it was a snow flurry because we were up in the Lake District shooting Muscle Bound, which was meant to be a day's shoot, you know, and then we got snowed in. And I know they pulled the the insurance money out and uh, and we shot for three days. And we came back with this Game of Thrones mini epic. And then I think yeah. you guys then shot your next video and went, right, that's it, where are we going? We're going to Sri Lanka. Oh, so, yeah, because you, <laughs> you basically pioneered the video as James Bond travelogue. Didn't you? <laughs> really? Right. Well, that, that's where MTV comes in because MTV is this joint venture between Warner Brothers and American Express. And they're starting this music, 24 hour music television network. You know, when, when you went to America, you know, at that time, what would you hear on the radio? Van Halen, Led Zeppelin, mm. classic rock, classic rock, classic rock. And I think, honestly, if videos had, had existed, you know, for that format, that's what they would have had. But they couldn't play that. They didn't really exist. So they were forced to kind of go new music. And we're looking for clips that have like a big sort of budget, kind of like that look glamorous, you know, with girls and exotic locations. That was the seed that was planted yeah. that led to us stopping off at Sri Lanka on the way to an Australian tour and making three videos for Fifteen grand or something, you know. No, I think that was a that was a genius idea, and of course, all all in the hands of Russell too. And it yeah. broke the British bands. Then were were the ones that all American kids were interested in. There was this beginning of this second yeah, British yeah, invasion, yeah, along yeah, with yeah. Boy George, of course. But for you, it was phenomenal. What happened to you in America was phenomenal. You were the new Beatles over there, without a shadow of a doubt. And how how did that feel for you, with all of your creative sensibility? I mean, I always been very excited to go to America, particularly New York. And uh, I was, it was so exciting and so much fun. I mean, it was very, very culty. You know, we'd be getting support from college radio stations. We were playing the one club in the city that would have like the equivalent of Bowie nights, you know, that would have new music Fridays or whatever. We never went below the Mason Dixon line until, we, until 1984. <laughs> Everything was up north. I mean, I remember going to Boston and meeting David Robinson from the cars, you know, and, and hitting it off and going back to his place. And, you know, and you really felt like you were on the cutting edge of things. But, you know, you've got to work America. You know, you can't just go to America and just play two or three shows. You've really got to roll up your sleeves and you've got to go back but back and forth. That and, was uh, a thing that was said about you. I remember at the time, which is that I think a lot of people didn't really appreciate that you did do the proper Hank Williams got on the bus and slogged around toilets, right? You really did, didn't you? You really have to. I mean, having said that, you know, MTV definitely helped. You know, and MTV, and now, you know, this is, yeah, this is the Rio album. Um, so this is 82, and the summer of 82, as MTV is going online around the country, we can see these pockets yeah, because I remember where being our records there, are starting. New, we did an American tour, New York was last, and New York never had MTV, and we had a completely different audience. We had an art audience where the places yeah. where MTV existed, we had girls, young girls who were going crazy for the band. And yeah. I suppose that, no matter how much you were slogging around America, John, the young girls that ended up buying so many of your records really could have got you through MTV, didn't they? I do, I do think that MTV had a profound effect and, uh, on a certain type of person. Countless, countless hairdressers, makeup artists, clothes designers, you know, arty types that are from Columbus, Ohio. 
you know, that literally, like, the, the video, the whole kind of presentation that MTV was opened their minds to there being another, <laughs> you know, another world, a more of an artistic world that existed outside of their, outside of Missouri or Wisconsin. It was very powerful culturally, I think, those first few years of MTV. I suppose as well... You were, it was possible then to be a global band because there were, even Europe was starting to open up, wasn't it? And and sucking in these videos and you could be successful anywhere. Well, we were fortunate to be on a record label, you know, that was an international record label that coordinated its products internationally. Europe was tricky for, for Duran, actually. Europe didn't really come easy. I would say that Europe, we never really conquered there's one or two territories that were very successful for us, but overall it was quite challenging. And so we kind of lent into the States, put more efforts over there and um, Asia, Australia and Japan. What was the record that first really made it for you? What was the moment you went, this is it? Fuck, you know, we are now global superstars. America have, have taken us. Back to the idea that we had this record label that was a multinational record label that was based out of London. There is none anymore. You know, and, you know, Hungry Like the Wolf, Capitol Records, which was the U U.S. subsidiary of EMI, they took that record to radio three times. They went back with it and back with it more, you know, whatever they do to say, you must play this record. You must play this record. It took a lot of doing. You know, there was the MTV. MTV were into the band, but you needed that FM, that widescreen FM thing. And, and Hungry Like the Wolf was, was the song that did that. And, um, you know, and that was summer 82. You also had the first video that was censored, didn't you? <laughs> Girls on film. Well, again, that, you know, that we never got very existed savvy. In concept. Yeah. Well, we got very savvy managers. They were just very conscious of, of areas that you could exploit. That's not an idea that I would have had. I would have never said, oh, let's do a fiesta style, you know, music <laughs> video and, and release it on Playboy video, you know. <laughs> well, I, I just wouldn't have got that. You know, you, Gary, I can't speak for you guys, but Gary, you had a visionary managing you. And Steve was, and I always say this to anybody that's trying to get a leg up, you've got to have a partner. You've got to have somebody outside of the artist who can see things differently, who has yeah. a different objectivity. No, you're, you're, I mean, absolutely, you you're absolutely right. I mean, when we formed our band, you know, you're in it because you're a guitar player. You're in it because you're a drummer. You, you know, Tony Hadley's in it because he's got a leather jacket and he was taller than anyone else. You know, it was like that. And then Steve Dagger comes along, who managed the band in the end. And he wasn't in to being a guitarist. He wasn't into being a musician. All his heroes were managers. So Brian Epstein, Andrew Lou Goldham, Kit Lambert. These, these yeah. were people he would be talking about and telling stories about. Malcolm yeah. McLaren, although he wouldn't have admitted that at the time, of course, was another one. I remember back in the 80s, you know, hearing that name, Steve Dagger was as glamorous as yeah. you were, you know, in the same yeah. way that Kit Lambert yeah. is, is so associated with the Hoover. You're right, which is why also I think a lot of managers go wrong when the bands are really successful because it's not about ideas anymore. Yeah. It's about running a business. And I think that's when the wheels tend to come off. Yeah. Not with Steve, not in Steve's case. Because no, you guys, you fell away from the Barrows Brothers in the end, right? It just got too much for everybody. And, um, you know, and the band kind of split in two ways. And Andy and I went off and did Power Station. And Simon, Nick and Roger did Arcadia. And the Barrows stayed with Arcadia. I'm not sure why we, Andy and I, kind of broke away. And we asked David Harper, who was Robert's manager, oh, yeah. to sort of start, you know, doing our business Robert for us. Palmer. And, um, yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you about that guy, you know, because, you know, how did you come to meet Robert? I met Robert when I was in Ice House, the Australian band. Oh. We did these festivals around Germany with Crosby, Stills and Nash, and Robert Palmer was on the bill, and he just liked the look of me. And he invited me out to Nassau. Oh, you had the right yeah. suit. And he invited me out to Nassau, and we wrote a load of songs, one of which was Go to Zero. Yes. So, yeah. which, is, uh, which I like Phenomenal. to think is what got Fantastic him. Fantastic track. Yeah, thank you. Which I yeah. like to think is well, what got him the know. gig. But were you guys splitting up yeah. at that point, John? Were you actually splitting up at that point? Had you fallen out with, with Simon and Nick? Or was this just a hiatus? It was just the pressure of, of, of delivering. You know, we were just under a huge amount of pressure. You know, we were cranking out these songs that kind of had to be big hits. And, um, you know, and we're doing it under... You've got kids camped outside your home, camped outside the studio. You know, and it's 
just a lot of pressure. Was there and everybody... also an element of, of saying, you know what, we've got a really teen audience because we had the same audience as you, you know, we had that teen audience as well. And I know that you, we love that audience, but at the same time we're thinking, but I want to be in a credible band of musicians that where boys like me as well. Was it a bit of that with Arcadia and Power Station? We've always had a very fragile dynamic between, the, I would say, the rock, the organic rock feeling and the kind of programmed electronica. And to me, you know, when we get it right, like on a song like Hungry Light, the Wolf, it's great. And um, I think Andy and I felt that the third album was sort of overproduced and was lacking, you know, did have the kind of the balls i hate to use that word but it didn't quite have the balls that we that we wanted to do so we we saw this opportunity to sort of like sidle off over here and do something a bit more organic and didn't really know what we'd be starting but was there a plan for arcadia to happen or was it just like well they're doing that so i suppose we should do this i or... think so <laughs> i think that's what i think that's what happened yeah. But Power Station was the most successful of the two. I mean, there was some. There was some well, you that's know. not for me to say. But but was it? <laughs> well, no, but it was well, a you sound. Know, you defined us. The, the Power Station defined a sound. I mean, that's the sound of, of Riptide, Robert's album. You know, it comes yes. directly from the. Yeah. Power and who was the drummer? Remind me. I forgot. Tony Thompson. Tony Thompson. <clears throat> I mean, God, that must have been on. Un... How was it for Roger then at that point, John? Where was he? Well, you know, Roger had gotten married. You know, he kind of moved to the Cotswolds. You know. I didn't want the party to stop. That was the thing yeah. for me. I just, I was just like, let's go more, louder, faster. You know, let's go to New York. Let's, hey, Tony Thompson, let's get another project on the go. You know, I mean, it was. I it, remember being I mean, very I, jealous. I, 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 I mean, it was, you know, it was just an amazing thing. It started out, it was like a stupid notion. It was like I was dating B.B. Buell, you know, one of these, <laughs> one of these like these girls, you know, and she'd been with a few others before me. Wow. And um, One she was a it. singer, <laughs> and uh, and I thought, let's do a song with Phoebe. Let's do a version of Get It On, and um, that was the genesis of it. And I got Dave Ambrose from AMI to you know give us a bit of studio time. And by the time you know we kind of got the schedule, I was out. Of, I'd fallen out with BB, but we decided to do it anyway. And then Tony, Andy, and I were sort of thinking, well, why don't we do it like the MGs? You know, why don't we have like this this like backing band and you know we'll have different singers coming in and do different tracks Bernard got on board and um, and then Robert and Robert came in and sang we'd written something I think it was communication and then he said what have you cut the T-Rex track and so we put it up and he listened to it he said I'd like to have a go at it and he sang it and then Bernard said you've got your singer you don't have to look any further Bernard so it became then it became this entity yeah I remember him going off because it was it was the time I was first in Nassau, and when just before I came back to it, he said, "Oh, I've got to go to New York. There's a, you know these Duran guys want me to have a go." So, oh, you know, I'll see. I was like, oh, okay, yeah. yeah. And I think I might have jokingly yeah. said, "Oh, why don't you take our songs with you?" <laughs> Which you <Yeah>. didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but you, well, you know, we nearly toured with you on that with the Power Station. I don't know if you know about that. We were in. The, it was a long negotiation. We were going to do an American tour together. And oh, and then and then wow. Robert left the band, and right. Michael Debar joined, and I think we got cold feet. Then we didn't know what yeah. you guys were going to be like at that point. Yeah, so, I mean Robert was just like, well, I haven't really signed up for this. I think he felt like he was being sort of pushed into something he didn't want to do. Plus, he was he was about to be out of his deal with Ireland. I don't think he had much money in the bank, to be honest. And I think you know. I think he was sort of offered a situation he couldn't refuse, which was, let's get this album done, and then we can do a big deal. He signed to EMI subsequently. But, I mean, he, he did Riptide, which is a masterpiece, yeah. you know? Yeah. I should have quit then. I mean, the, the credits on that album, is it says bass, Bernard Edwards, and Guy Pratt. It's, I just should have quit <laughs> then. <laughs> just have never picked up the bass again. <laughs> How was it for you playing with, yeah, working man. with Bernard Edwards, though? That was a massive hero of yours, wasn't he, John? Amazing. Amazing. I mean, it was a little nerve-wracking, but... Um, I mean, he was such a great producer, you know. I mean, the thing about I talk about Nile Rodgers a lot, but Bernard also. I mean, these guys, they're the kind of musicians that I say they've forgotten more than I will ever know. But they never made you feel small. They never made, I mean, that to me is the sign of a great, a truly great musician producer mm. that can just, you, they play, they, get, they pull over a guitar and they start doing something and you just, just gravitate towards them. You just want to be close. 
but they never make you feel less than. They never make you feel like a kid. Those guys were always made us feel great. They were always celebrated the talent that we had, and they were all about bringing it out. And, um, you know, Bernard was not as sort of effusive as Niall. He was much more low-key. And, you know, having Tony, Tony was like having a fucking, you know, bulldog in the room i mean tony was was yeah. a lot he took a lot of <laughs> a lot of work right did you ever play with him guy yeah I, well i did the last power station tour of japan oh right in the 90s when what, 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 in 96 so john had left by then <clears throat> john, yeah they came they got back together in the 90s then you who, who was in the band when you were doing it well i think john you decided you didn't want to do the tour then bernard died right so it was awful and there was this japanese tour booked i think it was an american tour book, which i didn't do and then uh and the way it was sold to me was like, well, you'd be standing in for Bernard. So I thought, well, you can't really say no to that. And also it was hanging out with Robert and going to Japan. So and was Andy in the band? Andy was in the band. Right? It wasn't that's, great. That's, that sounds like a, I lot, mean, it was a lot of partying, I would have thought. There was quite a lot of partying and it, it, it didn't really feel, you know, it didn't really have the right energy behind it. But it, it was great fun and how, play some great music. How did So how did the marriage come back together? How did you guys come back together once Power Station had sort of run its course and Arcadia had had their little way? Well, I remember Nick came to see me. I was, I, by now, I'm living in New York, and I'm living there with my girlfriend, and Nick comes to town with his girlfriend, and, you know, and he just says, look, you know, we can do our own things. I mean, Nick's very good like this. You know, he's he's really true to the cause, you know, and he's like, look, we can do, we can do our own things. And we have a very broad church. I mean, everybody in Duran Duran gets to do whatever they want, but you always come back. You know, maybe I was like, I don't know. It was something maybe I needed to hear at that time. We didn't know that we were going to come back and it was going to be a very different picture. You know, we didn't know that Andy and Roger were not going to come back. We were thinking, okay, so it's time to put the five-man band together. But it didn't work out like that. And so it took a while. What we did find is that, you know, when we finally did get back to the studio and we realized that for different reasons, Andy and Roger weren't going to be playing with us, the three of us, we go into this like siege mentality. We're like, oh, shit, it's just the three of us, and we've got to make this thing work. And Simon and Nick and I became bonded like crazy. Wow. And, what um, was the record you were you making? Know, that was Steve Notorious. Peroni came. Notorious. So that was with that Bernard. Was Notorious, which, is a, yeah. which is a great record. was with Nah, but there was... Oh, no. Because that was an incredible challenge. Lots of bands have lost more than one member, but not at once. I mean, that was amazing. You lost two people right. at once and came back from that. I've and got did, to say, that is a tip well, of the hat. So did Warren, did Warren play on that? Was that with Warren? Or he did play on that. Right. Now, here's something that could not happen today. You know, so Andy's moved to Los Angeles and unbeknownst to us, he's made a record deal and he's got, he's working on his own record and he forms a band with Steve Jones on second guitar, Terry Bozio on drums and Patrick Ahern on bass. Patrick and Terry are the rhythm section from Missing Persons, yeah. Warren Cucurullo's band, right? So Warren starts calling us in the studio and says, hey, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, you, I know you guys are looking for a guitar player. And we're like, no, we're, we're not looking for a guitar player. We've got a guitar player. So I think you're looking for a guitar player. Yeah, and we're like, we're like, no, 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 Ray, we've got a guitar player. He's just, you know, he's going to be coming over soon. And, and Warren's like, I don't think so. He's formed a band with my rhythm section. And we're like, what? <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine now, you know, with the internet and whatnot, there's just no way you can't do anything without our entire world knowing about it in real time. So that's kind of how we found out. So we'd moved the project to New York. We were finished doing overdubs and mixing in New York. And so Warren came out. And we just thought, well, let's try him out. And he came in and he played on a few songs. And it was like a contractual thing. Andy played on a couple of songs. But Niall really played the bulk of the guitar on that, on that album. Oh, he did. Right. Amazing. And the, and the album. And that's that a killer was... riff. That notorious riff yeah. is such a, a I do love. Yeah. Where did that come from? That talks us through the history of that song. Nick and I had started demoing tracks with Steve Peroni in London, just like jamming sort of ideas. And we were giving all the titles, Hitchcock film titles, so all these demos had like there was rope, there was vertigo, there was no so, but You've always and done so that. you've always to... done film titles, haven't you, John? Doesn't that that goes quite a way back? Well, we some like I it hot. We <laughs> did, yes, we did look to film titles. When are you writing the craze? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, go on. So carry on. Notorious. Well, yeah, a notorious. You know, I forget what parts we had of it, but it was also when we were we were at air when it was on Oxford Circus and Prince had come in 
to play at the at Wembley on the parade tour. And like everybody, I mean, oh, London yeah, yeah. was just going nuts that. for it. And it we was were a all circus going, for a week. And we yeah. were all going. And Niall had gone, joined him on stage in a club. And uh, I think kind of, you know, it was really like Niall sort of demonstrating it. I mean, it's a James Brown, you know, riff, you know, which, which Prince had also used. And I think it's really like Niall sort of showing how that kind of a thing, you know, happened. Was Niall a co-writer on that? No, he wasn't. And you know what? That's also something that has really changed in the last 20 years. Producers now always take a piece of the writing. But back then, they never did. Producers could come up with seriously important you know, musical ideas, but that, that's not what George Martin, you know, I mean, like they, they never got, that wasn't what they did. You know, a producer's job was to get the absolute best out of the, out of the artist, you know, and whatever it took. I think Niall, to his credit, you know, was never really been given the credit that say Quincy Jones has been given, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, she could never got Grammys, you know, he's really had to, you know, I mean, to know Niall is to love him, you know, to work with Niall is to really, is to really get him. You know, unfortunately, he's had to be his biggest cheerleader. Right. What year are we talking about now? With 86. 85. So, 85, 86. So yeah. how was that then going out on tour without Andy, without Roger? And, and how sort of accepting were the fans at that point of your new lineup? Well, they were. But, you know, we, we <laughs> I mean, this, you know, the records weren't selling it the same way. And, and, you know, I often talk about the zeitgeist. If you're lucky, right, once in your life, you're in it, you're riding it, right? And it's, that means you are the shit. You're not looking left or right. You're not looking for inspiration anyway. You're in it. If you can be in it for a year, that's pretty good. But our idol, you know, like Bowie, you know, he was in it for like four years, you know? Yeah. But like the thing about being in it is you know when you're not in it. And by the time Notorious came out, I was watching like where music was and where the hip shit was and it was over there and it wasn't where we were. We were trying to play catch up. And so we would say to ourselves, well, there's only three of us now, you know. And uh, I mean, we were, you know, we were proud of that record, of the record that we made. And we put a show together that had like, you know, horn section, piano player, backing vocalist, you know. I mean, it was a funky show. I saw you open you know, for and Bowie. It was organic. Yeah. And, right. You know, so it was great to do. It was great fun to be in a band like that. But, um, you know, you were just aware that, you know, you were going to have to pedal a little faster, you know. And, um, and I mean, around about this time now, I'm starting to get a bit like, like drugs and booze are getting a bit intense. And it's, it's quite difficult. You know, it's quite difficult. And MTV are like, oh, you know what, we're not, not really feeling this one. And Radio 1 are the same. And, you know, and it's a different day. Mm -hmm. I've got a few stories. My first time I met you guys properly, if I hadn't met you on Barrow's floor already, John. We were doing Tommy's Pop Show together in Germany. And then we, we were all really excited that we were all going to go out and have a drink that night in the hotel bar. And I remember the VIP rope had been set up for us, you know. And uh, the next day, we were flying back yeah. to London to do the Band-Aid record. Amazing. And I, rem I remember us, everyone decided we would have this kind of mad drinking competition. And our star striker, who was our drummer, John Keeble, he was out in the first five minutes. He was literally <laughs> under the floor before he, the twiglets had even been served, you know. But I remember all of us being quite sort of paranoid about the next day. We're going to Nick saying we, we're going to need a makeup artist to meet us at, at Heathrow Airport. There's gonna be so many people <laughs> at Heathrow Airport. And we get to Heathrow and there's nobody there. They're all outside Psalm, of course, you know. And then Spandau screw up. I don't know how you arrive. We screw up because our record company send us a Daimler princess to pick us up and take us to Psalm. Of course, like Sting has got, you know, been dropped off around the corner and the Banana Rama kids drop, turn up in some tiny little Volkswagen. Paul Weller's got a guardian <laughs> under his arm. <laughs> but it was quite an extraordinary day, wasn't it, to be there? That with suddenly all amazing. these bands we were in competition with were all in this tiny studio. Um, you know, Boy George was flying. Well, in. it does speak to the sort of fraternal aspect of what we were all doing, you know, and that Bob could see that. I mean, obviously, Bob was, I mean, it was remarkable what he achieved, you know, and how he, you know, how he seduced, how he went. I mean, I remember when Simon presented it to us. I mean, honestly, I mean, Simon was like, no, we're doing this. And Nick and I were like, really? You know, I'm not sure. Is it the right look for Duran? Yeah. You know, sort of thing. And, and Simon was like, no, this, we're going to do this. And with zero cynicism. You know, and I mean, in that day, the spirit of that day, yeah. I mean, I remember sitting in the control room when Trevor was producing Bono, you know, and, he, and Bono singing his line and Trevor just going, that one's for the stadiums, 
Yeah. <laughs> but like, and at that point, like you too, I mean, like you too were not, they were like in the waiting room. I know. I mean, they I were remember. not even... I remember, well, I remember I remember us saying, "Why are that Irish punk band here? You know, they're not they're not quite in the same league, are they?" <laughs> well, because remember, this was yeah, the time. Yeah. Remember, there was the moment where it was going to be you two or Simple Minds. Yeah, there was. Remember, yeah. there was actually a yeah. toss up moment there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I really loved the Cool and the Gang. But those guys were there. It's like, well, and I think Bob had <sighs> seen them out seen them out the day before or something, and said, "Hey, you, you know, to Robert Bell, like, come on down." Well, the know? most extraordinary moment and, was uh, we, we were there in the morning, obviously, and Bob then was actually on the phone to Boy George. He'd woken him up in his hotel room in New York, and said, "Get your ass over here now." Yeah, and I remember, you know, amazing. a few hours went by, and Boy George walked through the door because he'd flown over on Concord in three and a half hours. It was, it was an extraordinary moment. The other story that I remember, which makes me laugh about partying with you guys and hanging out with you guys, is um, 1987, we were doing a TV show together at the Koo Club in Ibiza. And I can't remember what it was for, but that was um, that the, was that the Olympics launch. Yes, thing? it might have been the Olympics launch, right? And Freddie Mercury doing Barcelona. Exactly. So so Spandau are all at this big party at Roman Polanski's house, and uh, and I'm standing with Steve Dagger, and all of a sudden this um, this security guy comes up to us, and what had happened apparently is you guys were flying in on a on a plane, and then said to the pilot. Can you go through to ground control and see if you can get in touch with a band called Spandau Ballet and ask them if they're going out? <laughs> so the so ground the pilot spoke to ground control. Ground control spoke to the chief of police oh in Ibiza who got in touch with the security um, guy who found us in the party and said, "Duran wants to know if you're going out." And we we passed the, the information back. And the next thing we're, we know, you are at the party. Simpler times. We always had our always had our priorities right. Yeah, but what's yeah. incredible about yeah. you guys, and you know, we obviously blew it like a thousand other bands. You know, very few bands stay together and make it through the hard times. I mean, you actually got back together, all five of you, in 2005. Duran have never officially split up. I do remember being at that gig in at Wembley, being hugely jealous that you were all back on stage together, but being totally inspired. At that moment, I worked my butt off to try and get Spandau Ballet back together, even though we've yeah. been through just as many crises as you had. But that must have been a great feeling. Right. I mean, it's like life, isn't it, guys? It's hard work. You know, it's hard work. And I think, you know, we're lucky that we had a few years where it was play, where it was fun. But, I mean, that reunion, oh, my God. I mean, I don't know how... I mean, we made it onto the stage. How we got there without me killing somebody, I just don't know. You know, and sometimes you're on a conference call, and I mean, you're meditating, you know, because you just want to levitate. So it is, you do it, but it isn't easy, you know, and I think that people think, because it is fun at the beginning, and if you're in a band, the chances are you're in a band because you've, you've got four or five guys, and you all kind of want to, you want the same thing, you know, and you all sort of, you know, you kind of like the same thing, but you, you grow, and you grow apart. I mean, I remember with Andy, you know, and, you know, Andy was back and it was like the original band and it was I mean, getting to those gigs. It was like Spinal Tap, man. I mean, I, it was really difficult, but we made a record, but Andy just wasn't game. You know, it just wasn't game. And I remember just reaching a point where I thought, you know what, I'm going to let go. I'm going to let go of him. It's just not worth it. You know, we've got four out of five today and uh, now we've got this empty chair. You know, and actually the empty chair can be really good, you know, because trying to keep that chemistry. I don't know what you guys find, but, you know, for me, it's the collaborators that, that breathe life into it. Because, you know, I know what all of my guys are going to say before they even open their mouths. I know what their ideas are going to be. I know what they're I know where they're coming from. You know, we've got like Errol Alkin on, on the new record. It's just like his energy. It's like is amazing and he can and he's getting me playing like the best bass I've played in a long time did you do some work with Graham Coxon Graham's playing guitar yeah. on the new record yeah yeah I mean absolutely you know absolutely I mean he's a he's brilliant he's, a, he's incredible yeah, my, my, you know, I think and, and, I think and you tried to call me John and it's just not gone through yet <laughs> I don't know what's going on there yeah I don't know why that's never really happened Gary I mean we, we you know I remember we almost 
we almost did some soundtrack work together, didn't we? We on did. A, we did. On an Alice Nandis did. project. He's right. very good in the uh, band yeah. that we're in. Unfortunately, in the in, you know we're together playing together with Nick Mason, the source full of secrets. And poor old Gary, he's forever keeps getting these reviews where they go, "Wow, who knew Gary Kemp could play guitar like that?" And poor <laughs> old Gary's I, getting really God, upset. I was so bummed <laughs> when you came out to LA to play. I was so bummed you didn't let me know. I was oh, dying to oh, that man. man, John. Sorry. John, yeah. you know what? Next now time. nowadays, time, yeah. definitely. Nowadays, we all appreciate each other much more, don't we? We can't wait to meet up properly. For sure. But you know what? I just For wanted sure. to just go back to the, just take you back to the very beginning and think about how I'm envious of you because you've still got those bunch of guys that you met in the late seventies. You and Nick still sit in a room with a drum machine, and uh, you know you're still trying to make the best music you possibly can together you're trying to make the best band that you could ever be still happen you still have that dream don't you and it's still working for you well i want to be you gary let me tell you i want to be you and i often think i want to be like gary more like (laughs) gary i think those of us that are driven to be successful particularly in the arts i mean like if i've got italian food on my plate i want that indian meal that's in front of somebody else i just can't help it i always i always think somebody's got it better than me but you know i think we appreciate the privilege of what we get to do you know i had no idea i was going to become a full-time professional musician into my 40s let alone at 60s it's ridiculous you know but it's it's something you've really got to treasure right yeah. you've really got to yeah. nurture it and look after it because yeah. i mean i think the first few years was like it was like a fly-by-night i felt a bit of a fraud to be honest i didn't feel like i could play all that well and i'd come to so much success so easily so when things started going south, I thought, oh, here we go. This is it. I knew this was coming. Simon, Nick, Roger, you couldn't meet three better guys in the music business. And you mean a you lot know? to and a certain generation be... as well, don't you? You mean a lot to a certain generation, mm. you know, which is still there. Well, isn't that wonderful? I mean, isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing to have touched people like that? I mean, I remember I came over to London to do Martin's This Is Your Life. And I was sitting backstage with the Shirley and, uh, you know, with some family members that were waiting to go on. George Michael was there as well. And True started playing as a cue for something. I'm not exactly sure. And the way that they, the way that they emoted, oh, my God, oh, my God. It was like, and I realized that, like that song, what it meant to them. It's so precious. And, you know, and to that, when, you know, you've got to know how important music is. You know what I mean? You know, when I was a kid, I spent hours in my room listening to fucking Starman and listening yeah, to you know yeah, what, you know, yeah. just all of my energy and all of my feelings, you know. I still you know, do. In, in Rider White Swan, you know. So, I mean, to be able to be a part of the next generation, yeah. you know, to be a part of their experience, be, really something. And thank you for being part of our rock on tours now. You, you're exactly. now... Yeah, this we're, is, we're being frantically <laughs> wound up I'm, here. We've, this is great because we've gone on and on and on. I'm very proud to be a part of it. <laughs> oh, yeah, man, you. listen, I can't wait to actually see you in person again. But it's great to reach across and, and say hello to you. And yeah, thank great you. To you. Both of you. Love you both. Thank you. Cheers, John. Cheers, John. Thank you. And that's it for this week's episode of Rock on Tours, which, like all of them, could have just gone on forever, frankly. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you, John. Thank you. See you at the next one. <laughs>